Columbia Workshop. Tonight, the Columbia Broadcasting System announces the appointment of William N. Robeson as permanent director of the Columbia Workshop. In keeping with the holiday spirit, Mr. Robeson presents as the first in a new series of workshop productions, part one of his own radio extraction of Lewis Carroll's immortal classic, Alice's Adventures Through the Looking Glass, with an experimental musical score specially composed for this broadcast by Paul Sterrett and Leif Stevens. Child of the pure, unclouded brow, and dreaming eyes of wonder, though time be fleet, and I and thou are half a life asunder, thy loving smile will surely hail the new tide gift of a fairy tale. Without, the frost, the blinding snow, the storm wind's moody madness. Within, the firelight's ruddy glow, and childhood's nest of gladness. Come, Take this gift from out the past. Come with Alice through the looking glass. Alice sat drowsily in the great armchair as the snowflakes fell gently against the window pane. Just as if they were kissing it, Alice thought. The black kitten, lying in her lap, purred in the warmth of a fire. And sleepily, Alice wondered. Kitten, can you play chess? Now, don't smile. I'm asking it seriously. Because when Sister and I were playing a little while ago, you watched just as if you understood. And when I said check, you purred. Well, it was a nice check, Kitty. And really, I might have won if it hadn't been for that nasty knight that came wriggling down among my pieces. <sighs> Kitty, dear, let's pretend that you're the Red Queen. Oh, yes, you do know who the Red Queen is. She's one of my chessmen. I'm sure if you sat up and folded your arms, you'd look exactly like her. Now, do try it. But the kitten wouldn't try. So to punish it, Alice held it up to the looking glass so it might see how sulky it was. And if you're not good directly, I'll put you through the mirror in the looking glass house. How would you like that? Very well, then. Mind your manners. And now, if you'll attend and not talk so much, I'll tell you my ideas about looking glass house. First, there's the room you can see through the glass. That's just the same as our drawing room. Only the things go the other way. The books are something like our books, too. Only the words go the wrong way. I know that because I've held up one of our books to the glass. And then they hold up one in the other room. And, Kitty, you can just see a little peep of the passage in Looking Glass House if you leave the door of our drawing room wide open. And it's very like our passage, as far as you can see. Only you don't know. It may be quite different beyond. There must be a garden and, oh, so many lovely things. Oh, Kitty, how nice it would be if we could get through into Looking Glass House. Let's pretend there's a way of getting through somehow, Kitty. Let's pretend the glass has got all soft like gauze, so that we can get through. Why, I declare, it's turning into a sort of mist. It'll be easy enough to get through now. Certainly the glass was beginning to melt away, just like a bright silvery mist. In a moment, Alice was up on the mantelpiece, through the glass, and had jumped lightly down into the looking glass room. Oh, 
My, my, they don't keep this room so tidy as the other. All the chessmen spilled among the things on the hearth. What? They are moving. They've come to life. The Red King and the Red Queen. And there is a White King and a White Queen sitting on the edge of the shovel. And here are two castles walking arm in arm. But Alice was too experienced a wonderland traveler to marvel much at the chessmen come to life. And she quickly ran through Looking Glass House, searching for the garden. When she came to the stairs, she discovered a new invention for getting down quickly. She just kept the tips of her fingers on the handrail and floated gently down without even touching the stairs with her feet. She floated on through the hall and would have gone straight out the door the same way if she hadn't caught hold of the doorpost. But at last, she was in a garden full of daisies and roses and violets and tiger lilies with a willow tree growing in the middle. Alice paused and quite naturally spoke to the tiger lily. Oh, tiger lily, I wish you could talk. We can talk. When there's anybody worth talking to. And can all the flowers talk? As well as you can, and a great deal louder. It is a matter for us to begin, you know. And I really was wondering when you speak. Did I to myself? The face is just some sense in it, so it's not a clever one. Still, you are the right color, and that goes a long way. I don't care about the color, though. If only her petals curled up a little more, she'd be all right. Um, uh, aren't you sometimes frightened at being planted out here with nobody to take care of you? There's a tree in the middle. What else is it good for? But what could it do if any danger came? It could bark. It says bow wow. That's why it's friends to the call. Bow. That's right, Daisy. Didn't you know that? Why, uh, it hadn't occurred. <laughs> Diamond, every one of you. <laughs> they know I can't get at them or they wouldn't dare to do that. Never mind, Tiger Lily. Now, Daisy. If you don't hold your tongue, I'll pick you. <laughs> There's just one other flower in the garden that can move about like you. I wonder how you do it. If she's like me, then there must be another little girl in the garden somewhere. Oh, she's one of the thorny kind. She's coming. It's the Red Queen. She's grown a great deal. When I saw her in the ashes a few minutes ago, she was only three inches tall. And now she's half a head taller than me. It's the Fred Gale that does it. Wonderful big fine air is out here. I think I'll go and meet her. Oh, no, no, no. You can't possibly do that. I should advise you to walk the other way. This sounded like utter nonsense to Alice, so she set off at once toward the Red Queen. But in a moment, her Red Majesty disappeared and Alice found herself walking into the door of the looking glass house again. There was nothing to do but try the plan suggested by the rose, so she started walking off in the opposite direction from where she had seen the queen. It worked beautifully, but a moment later she found herself face to face with the monarch. Where do you come from? Where are you going? Look up, speak nicely, and don't twiddle your fingers all the time. Please, Your Majesty, I came through the looking glass, and I don't know where I'm going, because I've lost my way. I don't know what you mean by your way. All the ways about here belong to me. But why did you come out here at all? Curtsy while you're thinking what to say. It saves time. You've had long enough now. Open your mouth a little wider when you speak. And always say, Your Majesty. I only wanted to see what the garden was like. Your Majesty? That's right. Delivery excellent. Posture fair. But as for subject matter, I can't give you as much. Now it's the garden. When you say garden... I've seen gardens compared to which this would be a wilderness. I thought I'd try to find my way to the top of that hill. Your when you say hill, I could show you hills in comparison with which you'd call that the valley. No, I shouldn't. A hill can't be a valley, you know. That would be nonsense. You may call it nonsense if you like. But I've heard nonsense compared with which that would be as sensible as a dictionary. Alice curtsied again for fear she had offended the Red Queen. And they walked on a bit until they came to the top of the little hill. A most curious country stretched out from the top of this hill. It was all divided into squares by tiny green hedges which bordered tiny little brooks 
flowing in straight lines across it. I declare it's marked out just like a large chessboard. Now, there ought to be some men moving about somewhere. Look for yourself. Yonder on the horizon, the red knight is capturing the white bishop. Why, it's a great, huge game of chess that... being played all over the world, if this is the world, you know. Oh, what fun! How oh, I wish I were one of them. I wouldn't mind even being a pawn if I could only join. So, of course, I would like to be a queen, Beth. That's easily managed. You can be the White Queen's pawn if you like, as Lily, her daughter, is too young to play. And you're in the second square to begin with. So when you get to the eighth square, you'll be a queen. Uh, if you're not captured... Is there any danger of being captured? Danger! There's always danger. And just at this moment, the Red Queen grabbed Alice's hand and began to run like mad. And as fast as poor Alice ran, the Queen kept urging... Faster! Faster! The most curious part of the thing was that the trees and the other things around them never changed their places at all. However fast they went, they never seemed to pass anything. I wonder if the things move along with us. Faster! Don't try to talk! Faster! 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 Are we nearly there? Nearly there? We passed it ten minutes ago. Faster! No! No! You may rest a little now. Why, I do believe we've been under this tree the whole time. Everything's just as it was. Of course it is. What would you have it? Well, where I come from, you generally get to somewhere else. But you ran very fast for a very long time, as we've been doing. A slow sort of country. Now, here, you see, it takes all the running you can do to keep in the same place. If you want to get somewhere else, you must run at least twice as fast as that. I'd rather not try, please. I'm quite content to stay here. Only I am so hot and thirsty. I know what you'd like. Here, have a biscuit. Well, uh... Do, just the thing for you. <coughs> While you're refreshing yourself, I'll take the measurement. And she took a tape out of her pocket and began measuring the ground and sticking little pegs in here and there while Alice choked on the biscuit. At the end of two yards, I shall give you your direction. <coughs> Have another biscuit? No, thank you. One, quite enough. Thirst quenched, I hope. <coughs> At the end of three yards, I shall repeat the directions for fear of your forgetting them. At the end of four, I shall say goodbye. And at the end of five... I shall go. So, I proceed to the two-yard pay. A pawn goes two squares in its first hole, you know. So you go very quickly through the third square, uh, by railway, I should think, and you'll find yourself in the fourth square in no time. Well, that square belongs to Tweedledee and Tweedledum. The fifth is mostly water. The sixth belongs to Humpty Dumpty. But you make no remark. I... I didn't know I had to make one just then. You should have said, it's extremely kind of you to tell me this. However, we'll assume it to be said. The seventh square is all forest, but one of the knights will show you the way. And in the eighth square, we shall all be queens, and it's all feasting and fun. I proceed to the three-yard pay. Speak in fresh when you can't think of English for a thing. Turn out your toes as you walk, and remember who you are. I proceed to the four-yard pay. Goodbye. I proceed to the five-yard pay. At the last peg, the Red Queen was gone, instantly vanished. And Alice, remembering that she was a pawn in this vast game of chess, realized that it was her move, and a third square was her objective. So she ran down the hill, and when she came to the first little brook, she jumped. Tickets, please. Sorry. Have your tickets ready. Sorry. Yeah, thank you, thank you, thank you. Now. Come in. Show your ticket, child. Don't keep him waiting, child. His time is worth a thousand pounds. I'm afraid I...
office 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 Although to her great surprise they fought in chorus. I hope you understand what this is like, but I'm sure I don't. All the time the passengers joined in silent unison, the train guard was looking at Alice first through a telescope, then through a microscope, and then through opera glasses. At last he said, "You're traveling the wrong way." His traveling companions were a queer group. There was a gentleman sitting opposite her, dressed in white paper, and next to him a goat wearing glasses, and next to the goat a beetle. There were others too, but Alice couldn't see them because the carriage was so dark. So young a child ought to know which way she's going, even if she doesn't know her own name. Ah! She ought to know her way to the ticket office, even if she doesn't know her alphabet. You'll have to go back from here as luggage. Change engines at. <laughs> that sounds like a horse. You might make a joke on that. Something about horse and sore throat, you know. He must be labeled last with care, you know. He must go by post. Says she's got a hand on her. She must be sent as a message by telegraph. She must draw the train the rest of the way. Never mind what they all say, my dear. I take a return ticket every time the train stops. Indeed, I shan't. I don't belong to this railway journey at all. I was in a wood just now, and I don't know how I got there. And I wish I were back there. <laughs> you might make a joke on that. Something about you would if you could, you know. Don't tease so. If you're so anxious to have a joke made, why don't you make one yourself? of an insect. What? And you don't like insects? Oh, dear. Oh, dear. <laughs> Nothing to get upset about. Nothing at all. Just a book. We have to jump over. I scarcely like the idea of a jumping train. Nothing to worry about, child. Well, it will take us into the fourth square, and that's some comfort. So hold on, everyone. Bye. felt the carriage rise straight up into the air, and in her fright she caught hold of the goat's beard. But the beard melted away as she touched it, and she found herself sitting in the middle of a wood. A few feet away, standing motionless, were two fat little men, each with his arm around the other's neck. It was evident at once which was which, for one had the word "dumb" embroidered on his collar, and the other the word "d." Tweeter's dumb and Tweeter's d. I suppose the word "tweedles" embroidered around the back of their collars. My, how they stare! It's scarcely polite. If you think we're waxworks, you ought to pay. You know, waxworks weren't made to be looked at for nothing. No how. Contrariwise, if you think we're alive, you ought to speak. I'm sure I'm very sorry. I know what you're thinking about. So do I. What? That, that horrid song. song. Tweedledum and Tweedledee agreed to have a battle. For Tweedledum said Tweedledee had spoiled his nice new rattle. The then blew down a monstrous crow as black as a tobacco, which frightened both the heroes. So they quite forgot their quarrel. Now that's what you was thinking about. Well, yes, it was. 
it isn't so, no how. Contrarywise, if it was so, it might be. And if it were so, it would be. But as it isn't, it ain't. That's logic. <laughs> they look so exactly like a couple of big schoolboys. <laughs> First boy. No how. Next boy. Contrarywise. You've begun wrong. The first thing in a school visit is to say, how do you do, and shake hands. As the two brothers were hugging each other, they held out the two hands that were free to shake hands with Alice. Alice didn't want to shake hands with either of them first for fear of hurting the other's feelings. So she took hold of both their hands at once. And immediately, the three of them started dancing round and round in a ring and singing... Here we go round the mulberry bush, the mulberry bush, the mulberry bush. Here we go round the mulberry bush so early in the morning. Here we go round the mulberry bush, the mulberry bush, the mulberry bush. I don't want to dance no more, no. Contrary wise, four times round is enough for one dance. I hope you're not much tired. No, how? And thank you very much for asking. Uh, so much obliged. Do you like poetry? Yes, pretty well. Some poetry. But now perhaps you can tell me which road leads out of the woods. What shall I repeat to her? Well, the walrus and the carpenter is the longest. If it's very long, would you please tell me first which road... It sounds worse if you sing it. Contrary-wise, it couldn't sound worse if I sang it. The sun was shining on the sea, shining with all his might. He did his very best to make the billows smooth and bright. And this was odd because it was the middle of the night. The moon was shining sulkily because she thought the sun had got no business to be there after the day was done. It's very rude of him, uh, she said, to come and spoil the fun. The walrus and the carpenter were walking close at hand. They went like anything to see such quantities of sand. If this were only cleared away, they said, it would be grand. If seven maids with seven mops swept it for half a year, do you suppose... The walrus said that they could get it clear. I doubt it, said the carpenter and shed a bitter tear. Oysters, come and walk with us. The walrus did beseech. A pleasant walk, a pleasant talk. Along the briny beach. We cannot do with more than four to give a hand to each. The eldest oyster looked at him, but never a word he said. The eldest oyster winked his eye and shook his heavy head, meaning to say he did not choose to leave the oyster bed. But four young oysters hurried up, all eager for the treat. Their coats were brushed, their faces washed, their shoes were clean and neat. And this was odd because, you know, they hadn't any feet. Four other oysters followed them, and yet another four, and thick and fast they came at last, and more and more and more, all hopping through the frothy waves and scrambling to the shore. The time has come, and the walrus said, to talk of many things, of shoes and ships and sealing wax, of cabbages and kings, and why the sea is boiling hot, and whether pigs have wings. Oh, uh, the oysters cried, before we have our chat. No hurry, said the carpenter. They thank you much for that. A loaf of bread, the walrus said, is what we chiefly need. Pepper and vinegar besides are very good indeed. Now, if you're ready, oysters, dear, we can begin to feed. And the oysters cried, turning a little blue. The walrus said, Do you admire the view? It was so nice of you to come, and you are very nice. And the carpenter said nothing, but cut us another slice. I wish you were not quite so deaf. I've had to ask you twice. It seems a shame, the walrus said, <laughs> to play them such a trick after we brought them out so far and made them run so quick. The carpenter said nothing, oh, but the butter spread too thick. I weep for you, the walrus said. I deeply sympathize. With sobs and tears, he <laughs> sorted out those of the largest size, <laughs> holding his pocket handkerchief before his streaming eyes. <laughs> oh, oyster, said the carpenter. You've had a pleasant run. Shall we be trotting home again? But answer came to none, and this was scarcely odd because they'd eaten Everyone. I like to 
walrus best because, you see, he was a little sorry for the poor oyster. He ate more than the carpenter, though. You see, he held his handkerchief in front so that the carpenter couldn't count how many he took, contrary-wise. Oh, that was mean. Then I liked the carpenter best if he didn't eat so many as the walrus. But he ate as many as he could get. Well, then, they were both very unpleasant characters. But I'd better be getting out of the woods, for really it's coming on very dark. Do you think it's going to rain? Put up the umbrella, Tweedledee, and see. Oh, yes, there. No, I don't think it's going to rain. At least not under here, contrary-wise. Well, may if it chooses. We've no objection, no how. Selfish thing. If it did rain, they'd be sure to keep the umbrella to themselves. Well, good night. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. Do you see that? What? Under the tree there. Oh, it's only a rattle. Not a rattlesnake, you know. Only an old rattle. Quite old and broken. I knew it. I knew it. It's spoiled, of course. You needn't be so angry about an old rattle. But it isn't old. It's new, I tell you. I bought it. I bought it. <laughs> Oh, 
Alan Clay by Minnesota Clay Broadcasting. Columbia Broadcasting.